In 11.3, we're going to go back to our power series. And remember, from the power series, we defined a Taylor polynomial, which is a power series that stops at some n value. Well, now we're going to look at the Taylor series. And the Taylor series comes from looking at the Taylor polynomial and not stopping at an n value instead taking the series from 0 to infinity. So that becomes our Taylor series. Again, it's because we're not stopping at an n value. There's no nth degree. Now, if it turns out that the center, and here remember our center is that a value. So if it turns out that the center is 0, then this Taylor series is called a Maclaurin series. So we're talking about a Taylor and a Maclaurin series. In example one, we want to find the Maclaurin series and the interval of convergence for the function. So first of all, I need to figure out what the series looks like. I'm going to take the derivatives and see if I can just compute of some of the terms and see if I can recognize a pattern. So if my function is sine of x, my first derivative is cosine. My second derivative is negative sine. My third derivative is negative cosine. Fourth derivative is sine. So we can see how we're back to where we started from. In this example, we're supposed to find a Maclaurin series. So since I'm supposed to find a Maclaurin series, I know that my center A is going to be equal to zero. So now all I have to do is plug these values into my series and see if I can recognize a pattern. So since a is 0, the first derivative evaluated at 0 is cosine of 0, which is 1. The second derivative is negative sine, so that's 0. The third derivative evaluated at 0 is negative cosine of 0, which is negative 1. And the fourth derivative evaluated at 0, it's going to be 0. So do you see the pattern? Even though I don't have the fifth derivative written down, it goes 1, 0, negative 1, 0. So this should be 1. And then the sixth derivative should be 0. Let's see if we can recognize a pattern. So my function sine of x is going to be equal to f of 0, which is 0, plus the first derivative evaluated at 0, which would just be 1, times x. The next term is 0, plus uh, the next term, oh, it's going to be a negative 1, so it's going to be negative x to the third over 3 factorial so I could have just written that as minus x to the third over 3 factorial the next term is 0 and then the next term should be x to the fifth over 5 factorial if I kept going, I could see that the next term would be 0, and then the next term would be a minus, actually. And it's going 1, 3, 5, so it should be 7. x to the 7 over 7 factorial. So I see this pattern. What I'm going to do is I'm going to ignore all the 0 terms and see if I can write a series for what remains. I want these to all kind of look the same so I can write down the pattern. I notice that I have a x to the third over 3 factorial, x to the 5 over 5 factorial, x to the 7 over 7 factorial. So this first term should be x to the 1 over 1 factorial. 
and now I can see that I have a plus minus plus minus I also have alternating so I know I'm going to have a negative one in there to some power um, the first term is positive so maybe if I start with usually our power series start at zero but I'm going to start at one because it, it's easier for me to see the pattern so if I start with k is equal to one I want to make sure that this term is positive so maybe I'll do k plus one so that'll make it square it'll be positive so I've got the alternating positive negative and now I have x to the one if I'm starting with k then that's x to the k oh wait but the powers go one three five seven the powers are odd so typically when we have odd powers remember what we do there we write it as 2k plus 1 or 2k minus 1 or 2k plus 3 or 2k minus 3 and so on so let's see is this going to be a 2k plus 1 2k minus 1 does it matter what if I wrote 2 to the k minus 1 then when k is equal to 1 this is x to the 1 so that works and since the exponent 1 and the factorial is the same I'm just going to write this as 2k minus 1 factorial so you might want to just double check to see if this describes x to the 1 over 1 factorial minus x to the 3 over 3 factorial plus x to the 5 over 5 factorial minus x to the 7 over 7 factorial and it does but typically when we work with power series we want to start with a k value of 0 so you could have started and written your pattern with the starting k value of 0 only it was easier for me to see the pattern if I started with 1. So remember, if I was going to re-index this, and I take away 1 from my starting, then I add 1 into my a sub k, my expressions. So if I add 1 to my k, this becomes k plus 2. But k would also work as well. And then if I replace k with k plus 1, I get 2 parentheses k plus 1 minus 1. That becomes x to the 2k plus 1 over the exact same thing. It would be 2k plus 1 factorial. So I have found my McLaurin series for sine of x. Again, all I had to do was get enough terms so I could recognize the pattern but now I need my interval of convergence so I'm going to use the ratio test because I see that factorial and now remember I'm going to be looking at the limit of this series but I'm only looking at the absolute value which means this negative one is going to be gone So I'm looking at, oops, and it was plus one. I was looking at the wrong one. So I'm looking at uh, using the ratio test to figure out my interval of convergence. I'm going to take the limit as k goes to infinity of the k plus one term. Remember what we're doing, we're ignoring the negative one because the absolute value took care of that. If I put in k plus one, this becomes x to the 2k plus 1 plus 1 divided by 2 parentheses k plus 1 plus 1 factorial all over the a sub k term which is simply the x to the 2k plus 1 divided by 2k plus 1 factorial this is still in absolute values I'm going to get rid of the complex fraction and write this as x to the 2k plus 2 plus 1. So this is going to be 2k plus 3 divided by 2k plus 3 factorial multiplied by 2k plus 1 factorial over x to the 2k plus 1 again all in the absolute values 
Now I can see that with this limit, if I write the x to the 2k plus 3 as x to the 2k times x to the 3, and the denominator, excuse me, the denominator is x to the 2k plus x, I could see that some things will cancel. I can also see that the factorial might cancel if I expand out the 2k plus 3 factorial to be 2k plus 3 times 2k plus 2 times 2k plus 1 factorial. And then this would be 2k plus 1 factorial over x to the 2k times x in the absolute values. So my x to the 2k's cancel, my 2k plus 1 factorial cancels, and in fact the x will cancel in the numerator and denominator, and this now becomes x squared. So let me come all the way back up here to finish this limit. I'm looking at the limit as k goes to infinity of x squared over, in parentheses, 2k plus 3 2k plus 2. I don't even need those absolute values, but I'll leave them on <clears throat> and I'll bring out the absolute value of the x squared because remember the limit is as k goes to infinity. And then the limit of 1 over the 2k plus 3, 2k plus 2. I don't need the absolute values because that's never going to be negative. That's going to go to 0, which means my limit is going to be equal to absolute value of x squared times 0. And now remember we just set that less than 1 to find our interval of convergence. However, since this is multiplied by 0, it doesn't really matter what I put in for my x it'll always be less than 1. So this is always true, no matter what my x is, which means my interval of convergence is going to be negative to positive infinity. And that also means I don't have to check endpoints. Although it's not asked, the radius of convergence will be infinity. So we were asked to find the series and also the interval of convergence. Let's look at another example. We want to find the Taylor series for this function. Our center is 1. Uh, so we get, have to use that longer formula. No matter. We're going to do what we did before. We're going to look for a pattern and see if we can write a series. So first of all, I want to find my derivatives, my first derivatives, or first derivative. So remember, this is x to the negative 1. It might be easier if I write it that way. First derivative is going to be negative x to the negative 2. Second derivative is going to be positive 2x to the negative 3. Third derivative is going to be negative 6x to the negative 4. I'll go one more. I'll do a fourth derivative, which would be 24x to the negative 5. If I were to write this without the negative exponents, I mean, I'm only doing this so that I could see if there's a pattern. Negative 1 over x squared. This is going to be a positive 2 over x to the third. Here we have a negative 6 over x to the fourth. And then the last one is a positive 24 over x to the fifth. If I look at the values of my function, I know that my center is 1, so f of 1 is 1. 
f prime of 1 is negative 1. Second derivative evaluated at 1 is 2. Third derivative evaluated at 1 is negative 6. And if I were going down to oops, the fourth derivative evaluated at 1, I get a positive 24. Let's see if we can write a series. So 1 over x is going to be equal to the first term is 1 minus x minus 1 in parentheses because our center is 1 plus 2 times x minus 1 squared and then that 2 factorial is just 2. I could see that the 2's will cancel minus 6 x minus 1 to the third over 3 factorial will be a 6 plus 24 x minus 1 to the fourth over 4 factorial which is 24. Okay, I can see my pattern. This is to the 1 power over 1. It looks like this will be equal to... Now if I were to start at... See if I go directly to 0. This alternates negative, positive, well actually positive, negative. So if I start at zero, I want the first term to be positive, so this could be a k. So positive, negative, positive, negative. And I see that coefficients cancel with the denominator. So all I'm worried about is the x minus one. and figuring out what the exponent would be. Since I'm starting at zero, and my first term is one, that would be at the zero power. So it looks like this is simply to the k power. That wasn't bad at all. And that would be what my one over x is. Again, it's a, you always do the same thing, right? You expanded it out, expand it out enough so that you can recognize a pattern. Once you have your pattern, you have your series, once you have your series, you have to check um, the interval of convergence. And it looks like since I'm going to be looking at the absolute value and then negative 1 to the k will go away, it looks like I'm just looking at the limit with x minus 1 to the k power. So I'm thinking root test. I think I'm going to do the limit as k goes to infinity of the kth root of the absolute value of x minus 1 to the k so that the root and the exponent cancel and I have the limit as k goes to infinity of the absolute value of x minus 1. Well that's nice. Notice that there's no k there. Uh, so this is like the limit of 1 if I were to pull the x minus 1 and absolute values out. But I'm going to leave them there. As k goes to infinity, x minus 1 absolute value is just a constant. So it remains the same. So remember, this will converge where this absolute value is less than 1. So if I were to get rid of the absolute values, this is negative 1, less than x minus 1, less than 1. So adding 1 everywhere gives me 0, less than x, less than 2. So my possible interval of convergence is the interval from 0 to 2. But I still have to check the endpoints to see if I can include them. I'm going to do that off to the side here. If x is equal to 0, 
that gives me this series from k equal to 0 to infinity of putting in x is equal to 0, I get 1 to the k power, but that won't matter. This diverges by divergence test. And then when x is equal to 2, again putting it into my original series with the negative 1 there, uh, 2 minus 1, 1 to the k, so this just becomes negative 1 to the k. This is alternating series. Um, however, if I just do divergence test, it'll also diverge. So I can't include 0 or 2. My interval of convergence is the interval 0 to 2. Now we're going to look at a special series. It's called the binomial series. And if you've had probabilities, you've probably seen this. First thing we want to talk about is what a binomial coefficient is. So if we have a function that is 1 plus x to some power of p, and here p can be any real number. It can be negative, positive, decimal, fraction, doesn't matter. Then this will expand out into p over 0, p over 1, p over 2, p over p. Those will be our coefficients uh, on our x's. So these are what we call our binomial coefficients, and this is how they're defined. So for any p over k, k is an integer. You expand it as you start with p, minus 1, minus 2, and so on, over k factorial. When you're computing these binomial coefficients, it's the k that really matters because that tells you in your numerator how many factors you have. It's understood that p of 0 is 1. In example 3a, it's 7 over 5. So here I'm concerned with what my k value is, which is 5. I need that because that tells me how many factors I have in my numerator. I start with my p value of 7, and I just keep subtracting 1 in my product. So times 6, times 5, times 4, times 3 and I have five factors, and that's over five factorial. I'm gonna go ahead and expand out five factorial because I don't feel like grabbing, oops, five times four times three times two times one. I don't feel like grabbing a calculator, and a lot of times these binomial coefficients are really nice, as long as the k values are not so large, because things cancel, the fives, the fours, the threes, uh, the 1, 2 goes into 6 3 times. This binomial coefficient is simply 21. Let's look at another example. Part B, I have negative 2 over 4. So again, I'm really concerned with this k value because that says I have 4 factors in my numerator. I start with negative 2. Minus 1 would give me a negative 3. Minus 1 from that, I get a negative 4. And then I stop at negative 5, because now I have my 4 factors. 4 factorial, I can write as 4 times 3 times 2 times, don't even have to write the 1. I can see that in the numerator it's going to be positive, because I have a negative times a negative times a negative times a negative. And I could cancel 4, 3, 2, I don't need that 1 and this becomes a positive 5. Now that we know how to compute the binomial coefficients, we're going to look at the binomial series. And our binomial series is k is equal to 0 to infinity, p over k, x to the k. In this textbook, since the first term in the binomial series when k is equal to 0 is 1, they pull that term out and write 1 plus k 
is equal to 1 to infinity of p over k x to the k. Uh, that's not consistent with all textbooks, that's just this textbook. And then I have a little typo here. I was going to replace the p over k with x to the k and write this as a series from k is equal to 1 to infinity of 1 plus. So that equal sign shouldn't be there. It should be here in front of the 1. Expanding this out, I get the terms 1 plus p times x plus p times p minus 1 over 2 factorial, x squared, and so on. So the series is going to converge so that the absolute value of x is less than 1. So again, we're using absolute value of r less than 1 as um, our template. Possibly also at the endpoints. So you still have to check endpoints here. If our p-value is not negative, then the series will terminate. And it turns into a polynomial of degree p. So again, this is just a special form of a Taylor series. Example four, we're going to find the first four terms of our Taylor series centered at zero. So since the center is zero, we're talking about a Maclaurin series. We're going to use the first four terms to approximate the given quantity. So in this particular case, we don't have to find a pattern and write a series. The reason why is because it just says find the first four terms. So what it's saying is that this function is going to be approximately equal to, because we're only using four terms, of our first term is 1. And here notice that our p-value, this is binomial, is negative 2. and a is equal to 0. Our center a is equal to 0. When I do my approximation, it's 1.1 to the negative 2, so that means my x value that I'm going to plug in once I get my four terms is going to be 0 0.1. Uh, when k is equal to 1, I'm using the k is equal to 0 to infinity. I actually prefer that form. This becomes uh, minus 2x, and then it's a plus negative 2 times negative 3. Maybe I'll just write it out over 2 factorial x squared plus negative 2, negative 3, negative 4 over 3 factorial x to the third. Uh, 1, 2, 3. It looks like I have four terms, so I can stop. So my function is approximately equal to 1 minus 2x. Uh, 6 over 2 factorial is going to be 3. 3x squared minus negative 24 over 3 factorial turns into 4. So these are the first four terms. Now, if you're asked to find, say, four terms, and as you're doing your computation, some of those terms are 0, then you have to keep adding enough terms so that you have four non-zero terms. f of our x value of 0.1 is going to be approximately equal to 1 minus 2 times 0.1 plus 3 times 0.1 squared minus 4 times 0.1 to the third. Uh, so I'm just going to plug that in a calculator because I really don't feel like putting that, uh, doing it by hand. So it looks like it's 0.826. So I found the first four terms. 
and then I use that to approximate the value of f of 0.1, which would be approximating the value of 1.1 to the negative 2. So that would be approximately equal to 0.826. So right now what we're going to do is we're going to use this binomial series to evaluate a series that we're not familiar with. Example 5, I'm given the square root of 1 plus x. So notice that this is binomial because it's 1 plus x to the 1 half. My p-value is 1 half. And I'm also given an expansion. Uh, out listing the first four terms. So that's already given to me. What's also given to me is my interval of convergence, negative 1 less than x less than or equal to 1, or parentheses negative 1 to positive 1 with a bracket. Now I want to find the first four terms of this series, which is centered at 0, so that's my a, uh, square root of 4 minus 4x. Four I want it to get to look like the square root of 1 plus x. If I factor out the 4, the square root of 4 becomes a 2 on the outside of the square root, and this becomes 1 minus x. But I have a 1 plus x. So I could write this as 2 times the square root of 1 plus negative x. And now in the expanded form, all I have to do is replace x with negative x. Don't forget that we have the 2 in front. So the square root of 4 minus 4x is going to be equal to 2 times this series, where all I have to do is replace x with negative x. x with negative x. Don't forget the parentheses around the negative x. x with negative x. And that's my series. It converges for negative 1 less than replace x with negative x less than or equal to 1. So I'll deal with that in a little bit. I want to simplify this a little bit. So this is going to be 1 minus x over 2 minus x squared over 8 minus x to the third over 16. However, I'm going to be distributing this 2 as well. So if I do distribute the 2, or maybe I'll wait to distribute the 2 and rewrite this as 1 minus x over 2 minus x squared over 8 minus x to the third over 16, and so on. Distributing the 2, this becomes 2 minus x minus x squared over 4 minus x to the third over 8. We found the first four terms. And then we also want to state the interval of convergence. All I have to do is multiply through by a negative 1 on this inequality, remembering to flip the inequality symbol. And then now this is negative 1 less than or equal to x less than 1. That would be my interval of convergence. Or if you want to write that in interval notation, it would be negative 1 with a bracket, comma, oops, 1. Why am I writing 0? With a parenthesis. Now we don't need to check the endpoints because we use that theorem. Uh, where we're doing a composition of functions. So whenever you have a top composition of functions, you don't have to check the endpoints. However, if you were to check the endpoints, uh, you would find that that's what you would get. I took that same problem in example 6, and I changed it around just a little bit. So notice the center is the same, except for we have the square root of 4 plus 16x squared. When I look at the square root of 4 plus 16x squared, that tells me if I factor out a 4, take the square root, it's 2 times the square root of 1 plus 4x squared. So now I'm going to replace x with 4x squared. And then the square root of 4 plus 16x squared 
will be equal to, I have this 2 on the outside, wherever I see x, I'm going to replace it with 4x squared. 1 plus 4x squared over 2 minus 4x squared squared over 8 plus 4x squared to the third over 16 minus and so on. Here my interval of convergence is going to go negative 1 less than 4x squared less than or equal to 1. Simplifying within the inside of the parentheses looks like it's going to be 1 plus 2x squared. And here we're going to have 16, it's going to be a minus, 16x to the 4th over 8, so 2x to the 4 over 8, or no 8, it's gone, minus, plus, can't speak, 4x to the 6, minus, and so on. Distributing the 2, the first four terms would be 2 plus 4x squared minus 4x to the 4th uh, plus 8x to the 6th minus and so on. So these would be my first four terms. Our interval of convergence, I would divide everything by 4 to get negative 1 fourth is less than x squared which is less than or equal to positive 1 4. And now whenever you don't have just x, if you have like x to the third or x squared or some higher power of x, you really want to think about this. Or if you had the square root of x. Now it's saying that x squared is between negative 1 4 and positive 1 4 and I can include positive 1 4. So since I can include positive 1 4 and I'm squaring, I should be able to include the negative 1 4. And in fact, since this is x squared, I really know that I can simply say that it's 0 less than or equal to x squared, less than or equal to 1 4, right? Because I'm squaring my x. Now if I just look at x squared less than or equal to 1 4 and I square root both sides whenever you square root x squared you have to have the absolute values and my interval of convergence is now going to be negative 1 half to positive 1 half and I can include both negative 1 half and positive one half in my interval of convergence. So we're going to go back to looking at our remainder that we talked about in previous sections. So recall that the remainder is equal to the n plus 1 derivative over the n plus 1 factorial for some c value within an interval between x and your center a. So as a reminder, remember that if you're looking at the remainder r of x, then that has to be less than the absolute value of the remainder, right? Because the remainder can be negative. And recall that this absolute value of a remainder is going to be less than or equal to the absolute value of the n plus 1 derivative for some c value over the n plus 1 factorial. Uh, and then here it's going to be times the absolute value of x minus a. Everything is absolute values. I could have put this inside the absolute values with parentheses around it, but I chose just to leave it out. So we know that's true as well. In example 7, we want to find the remainder for this Taylor series. We have the center is 0, 
and our function is sine of x. And I conveniently sh chose sine of x because I know what the power series representation is since we already did that in our first example. So all we're asked to do here is to find the remainder and show that the limit of the remainder is zero. And here's the reason why. We've been loosely using the idea that all of these series are equal to a function, but we never proved that the series were equal to a function. So this theorem, convergence of a Taylor series, proves that the function is equal to the series. So if you have a function and the derivatives exist on some interval, you can think about that as being the interval of convergence containing our center A. So the Taylor series, not the function, the series for the function converges to the function if, for all x in our interval of convergence, if and only if the limit of the remainder is zero. So what that says is that if you take the limit of the remainder and it's equal to zero, then the Taylor series converges to the function, which means the Taylor series is equal to the function. So now we can say that these two are equal, although we've been doing it all along. This proves that they're equal. We want to find the remainder for this Taylor series. We want to find r sub n. And I already know what the series is for sine of x. Ooh, I want a thinner one. Because we had previously shown that sine of x is equal to the series from k equal to 0 to infinity of negative 1 to the k x to the 2k plus 1 over the 2k plus 1 factorial. So we already showed that that's what sine was equal to, where the interval of convergence is just negative to positive infinity. So we have this series, but is it true that sine is equal to that series? Or does it just get closer and closer and closer, but never equal? And that's what we're going to verify. Let's find our remainder. Well, I know my remainder has to be less than or equal to the absolute value of the remainder, which going back to a previous section is going to be m times, here my center is 0, so absolute value of x minus a is just absolute value of x to the n plus 1 over n plus 1. This is what I'm going to use from our previous section. I also know what my n plus 1 derivative is. And I'll just use x for any x. I know that it's going to be equal to plus or minus sine or plus or minus cosine. So it's got to be one or the other. I'm going to take the absolute value and note that the absolute value of this derivative will always be less than or equal to 1 because sine and cosine are bounded by negative 1 and 1. So I'm going to choose my m value equal to 1. So this remainder has to be less than or equal to, if m is 1, this becomes the absolute value of x to the n plus 1 over n plus 1 factorial. <clears throat> so clearly, if my remainder is less than or equal to this expression, and the limit as, I'm going to use n, I almost wrote k, goes to 0 of r of n of x. I know that that limit has to be less than or equal to the limit as n goes to infinity of this absolute value of x to the n plus 1 over n plus 1 factorial. 
So this I know. That limit, however, is x to the infinity over infinity factorial. I don't know what that is. And using L'Hopital is not going to help me. I'll get an infinity over x to the infinity over infinity. However, I can use, to evaluate this limit, I can use growth rates. Because I know that x to the n grows slower than n factorial from my growth rates. So n plus 1, n plus 1 doesn't really make a difference. So I know that the numerator is going to grow slower than the denominator which means this limit is actually going to be equal to zero. And I can justify that by just saying by growth rates. So I've shown that the larger goes to zero. That means that the smaller, r sub n, will also go to zero. So this is kind of getting around that. So the limit is going to go to zero, and I'm done. I found the term for the remainder, the absolute value of x to the n plus 1 over n plus 1 factorial. And I've taken the limit and gotten 0. The last thing I want to do is look at this table 11.5. And you should probably have this somewhere for you to refer to. Is what it does is it lists a bunch of functions their expansion and their power series representation along with intervals of convergence. So we have 1 over 1 minus x, 1 over 1 plus x, e to the x, sine of x, cosine of x. And we already proved that sine of x. Cosine of x is very similar. We have natural log. We have negative natural log of 1 minus x, tangent inverse. We even have hyperbolic functions in here. And the last one would be that binomial series that we looked at. So you might want to keep this handy. We're going to use this table in 11.4. So we're done using Taylor's series to approximate the value of functions. What we're going to move into in 11.4 is using these series to evaluate definite integrals and to also look at limits that we couldn't evaluate previously. And that's it for this section.